episode four of the IT Curio Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Kenimer, and today I am thrilled to introduce a very special guest, Jess Vachon. Jess is a Chief Information Security Officer and a really neat person. She works at Context Labs, which is a company that's literally working to save the world. She's also got a lot of experience in cybersecurity, and today she's going to be sharing with us the current cybersecurity landscape. She's going to share some tips on how individuals and businesses can protect themselves against all this crazy stuff that's going on these days with cybercrime and cyber threats. Jess, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Cameron. I'm excited to be here and excited to have this discussion with you. Me too. Jess, your journey in cybersecurity is truly remarkable. Would you mind sharing with our audience what ignited your passion for cybersecurity? What's the, what's the story behind that? Sure. So I have a long background. I hope we have some time in the podcast for this all. Um, so I started learning computers uh, as a kid, Vic Commodore 20, uh, buying the programming magazines and figuring out how to program games. Uh, and then I didn't touch computers for a while until I went in the military. Uh, post-college. Uh, I learned basic electronics there and telecommunications to begin with. Halfway through my military career, I changed to become an officer uh, in the Marine Corps, and I was trained trained on communications. So there I started to really play with the data communications, satellite communications, uh, and learning how everything tied together to um, form a comprehensive global network. Uh, and of course, inherent in that is we had to protect our communications and our data um, from adversaries. So that sparked the curiosity in me. Around the year 2000, I left the service and went to work for Cisco Systems, uh, which is where I started to learn my routing and networking. From there, moved to Chase Bank uh, and really learned the firewalls. And that's when I was doing security on a daily basis daily uh, basis. Um, moved into leadership after that, did some security consulting. And in my time in leadership, specifically in healthcare, uh, over the last eight to 10 years, when I was really leading that the efforts in IT, we started to realize, hey, security has to be a bigger part of the, the whole organization and our operations. And I was spending greater than 60% of my time working on securing the organization. I decided this is what I want to do pursued my certifications, and then did the transition into just doing cybersecurity all the time uh, as a, an information security director for a manufacturing company. And that just evolved into a, a couple CISO roles. And I ended up today with a software company who, as, as you mentioned, is working to help reduce carbon uh, and track decarbonization efforts across the globe. You've got great experience in the industry. It has a really great background. I think your experience in healthcare kind of gives you a unique perspective on compliance. Uh, also working with a company in Europe that is subject to the GDPR, uh, you have a lot of experience with regulatory, the regulatory aspect of cybersecurity, which I think is really cool. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's going on these days with cybersecurity regulation and the scuttlebutt is, is that GDPR is going to be a thing not only for healthcare companies, you know, they have to comply with HIPAA, but it's going to be something that is required for every business owner. Isn't that true? It's headed in that direction, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, so many companies are holding the information of individuals across the globe. So it's not just in certain states. It's not just in the EU. China's holding information other Asian countries are holding information. Um, Australia is holding information. So it's everywhere. What we really need at some point is to take all these disparate programs and make them into one global, global agreement. And I'm kind of surprised that the UN hasn't pushed that more forcefully mm. or the G7 or groups like that. Um, it's come up from the front lines. You know, one could say that individuals have pushed it in their own countries. Um, but we look now, and even in the United States, you've had the CCPA, and then Virginia's had a version of their own Privacy Act, and now you're seeing other states starting to develop their Privacy Acts. I believe Minnesota is currently developing one. Um, it becomes very challenging for the cybersecurity executive 
to follow all of these different regulations. Um, not where I'm at now, but my previous employer was a global employer. We were following and tracking six different privacy laws across the globe, having to take those together, coalesce them, and figure out how do we address our core business policy so it addresses the needs of all these different com- countries and all these individuals in the, these different countries. For the most part, they overlap, but there's some nuance depending on what country you're in, which really makes it a challenge. It makes it a challenge from enforcement, from policy writing, and from legal aspects. Very true. Very true. I think there's a lot of confusion out there right now among business owners in regards to not only are they having questions about what do they have to do to protect themselves and what are the actual cyber threats? Business owners struggle to even understand what the threats are. I was just approached by someone who is an insurance broker, and he had questions about, for my company, we do IT managed services. He said one of his biggest challenges was that the companies out there, they come to him and they say, hey, I, I have to get this cyber insurance, right? But what the heck is all this stuff? You know, I have this list of requirements. You know, I need endpoint security. I need firewalls. I need multi-factor authentication. I don't even know what half of this stuff means. He's looking at him like, well, I don't know either. (laughs) So from what he told me, insurance companies out there who develop these policies where they would protect companies and they would just they say, okay, here, it's X amount of dollars, sign right here, you're covered. And they didn't do any kind of qualifications for those business owners. And then they're getting bur- the, the insurance companies are getting burned because of course they get hacked. The insurance companies are getting burned because they didn't even bother to ask them, well, are you all sharing one password at the office? Yeah, we're all sharing simple stuff like that. Are you are you password protecting things like basic stuff? They didn't even bother to ask them anything. So they would get burned. So now they've got, like the pendulum has swung opposite in the other direction. And they have this huge list of requirements that you have to have in order to qualify for this insurance. And it's leaving business owners just scratching their head. So I agree with what you're saying. I think there needs to be some kind of centralized place where people can go to kind of figure out what the heck is going on. And uh, as you know, it's getting bad. It's getting worse every every year. It's nuts. But uh, it also presents a lot of opportunities for pros like you to step up and just lots of opportunities for everybody. People who are thinking about career changes, opportunities for them too. Um, Very cool uh, business to be in right now from my perspective. Yeah, other, absolutely. Other- and you bring a good point, bring up a good point about cyber insurance. You know, eight to 10 years ago, you just went and got a policy because there weren't a lot of events that had been paid out. That's completely different now. I was filling out those questionnaires 10 years ago and, and thinking, they're not asking me any questions of any relevance. And now when they send that list over, it's detailed and I have to provide proof of what I'm doing. And if I have reports, I'm pushing those reports across because they want to see those. And oh, by the way, the deductibles are very, very high now and the coverage is lower and lower and lower. So it's a real challenge for smaller businesses. I think that's why we're seeing the growth of the V-CISO or fractional CISO role because there's people with this expertise that can now and go help those companies that have, you know, under a thousand people or under 500 people that need this help, but can't afford to bring that expertise in house. So um, yeah, an interesting and and changing landscape. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jess, can you tell our listeners who might not be as savvy, uh, what exactly is a fractional CISO? Sure. So I myself am in the role of a full-time employed with one company, chief information security officer. A lot of other companies, smaller companies will go to a resource who has the expertise and say, I can't afford to have someone 40 to 60 hours a week. I need maybe 40 hours a month. So professionals such as myself who have chosen not to work for one company have started their own firms where they where they were will offer out portions of their hours, portions of their services as needed to these companies. It makes it more affordable for those companies. They get the expertise from the bench when they need it. Um, And when they have other priorities, they can allocate their resources to those other priorities because 
they have to keep the business running. Otherwise, there's no reason to have us helping them out. So um, that niche of the cybersecurity field is very important. And, you know, those individuals who fill those roles are no less skilled than me. And in some aspects can be more skilled because they're seeing more different types of business. Uh, they're interacting with more individuals and they're seeing different threats than I see just from my one lens with my one company. So Jess, tell us what's going on out there these days. It's constantly, you know, like we've mentioned before, it's a, everything's constantly changing. There's new threats all the time. There's new problems, new challenges, opportunities. What's going on out there these days? Describe the cybersecurity landscape for us. Okay, well, most people probably haven't heard of AI, right? Uh, obviously, that's a joke because AI is everywhere and in everything now. Um, so that's the hot topic of the moment. Uh, not unusual in my career field that you have a hot topic that comes in and then it goes away and then a new one comes in, then it goes away. Uh, this one seems to be sticking a little bit more. Um, I don't know that any of us know quite what to make of it yet. We know that there's a potential for threat or a potential for misuse in AI. Um, we know that threat actors are leveraging it, and they have the advantage of time and financial resources to explore it and exploit it. Um, so we're trying to play a little bit of catch up. Um, I think the calls for some regulation around it are well-founded, because we really yeah. don't know um, what it's going to mean. For all of us, even those people who have invented or are creating AI and improving upon AI say, we don't understand fully how it works. Well, you know, if you didn't understand how a car worked and you were launching it down the road, you probably would think twice about doing that. So um, this could be yeah. as potentially dangerous or more so dangerous uh, than an un uh, unmanned vehicle, so to speak. You are a CISO. That probably means something different than it did five years ago. If there were even, there weren't even CISOs probably six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, probably didn't even ex exist. This is a role that is constantly changing too. How have things changed for you over the years? How, where, do you, where do you see it going? Uh, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, this role kind of evolved from the lead person, the the highest skilled person in the cybersecurity part of IT. Um, and that's that's kind of goes along with the growth of IT in itself, right? If we look back, businesses started to buy computers from IBM and uh, HP and bring them in and data started to be collected. And whoever learned it first was IT. Uh, and then over time, they started to do some research and develop some methodologies and um, some basic IT frameworks of how IT should work, and it became it started to mature, and then you saw the rise of the CIO uh, because you needed someone who could take the technology and speak to the business or follow through on the business initiatives in terms of data and, and compute resources. It's been the same thing for the CISO. As I mentioned earlier, eight to 10 years ago, I started to see my career as a CIO kind of diverge because I was doing so much security. And it came to the realization of many of us, we can't wear both these hats. It's it's just too time consuming. There's too much to know. It's changing too quick. So we need to have this separate profession um, that is the expert in managing the security and compliance for the business. Well, you can't just be the tech person anymore. You need to right. be a business person. You need to understand that this area that has traditionally been conceived of or viewed as an expense, you need to convert that into being an investment in the business. It's an investment like insurance for the business. Beyond that, if, if you're really thinking business-minded, you want to look at what you need to do in terms of cybersecurity and compliance and figure out how to turn that into marketing and sales. How can they say, hey, what you're doing over here has value. We can now turn around to our customers and say, we have a secure product. This is what we're doing to develop our product. We have a secure infrastructure. This is what we're doing to protect our infrastructure. And this is why it matters to you. And that is why when you're looking at us or a competitor, you should go with us. So you very much have to have your business hat on at all times. You also have to be a master of communication. Um, 
We traditionally grew up talking very technical terms and a lot of jargon that doesn't fly in the boardroom. You have to be able to say things in very simple terms. And you have to be willing to repeat it over and over again. You also need to be able to listen because you have to hear what the frustrations of the business are and what the priorities of the business are. And somewhere in all this, you've got to take your technical skills, your business skills, your communication skills, your listening skills, and be the advisor that the business needs at any given point in time. So it's definitely matured. It's more challenging. Um, I think if you if you don't have a lot of patience, if you're not a good communicator, if leadership doesn't come um, naturally to you, it's probably not the role for you. Um, and that's not bad because there's plenty of other roles for people to mature sure. into that aren't the CISO role. Absolutely. What strategies do you use to help protect data, to help secure your company? What do businesses need to do to protect themselves? Sure. Um, well, if you can afford to get someone in the organization that can lead these efforts, start there. But if you can't, um, that shouldn't prevent you from moving forward. There's some very basic things you can do. One is learning. You have to learn how to have good security. And that could be reading um, examples of things that have happened to other businesses and what the recommendations are to prevent those. Um, it could be just understanding what you do to protect yourself at home, right? So in your house, you lock your doors. In your home, you may have a camera system. You may have an alarm system. You might have a dog. You might have some early warning system that tells you when there's danger around you. You might even put a fence around your yard. Um, so those are the same basic things you want to do for your business. You know, um, make sure that your account access requires more than just the username and password. Add something to that. We call that multi-factor authentication. Um, something that you know that no one else knows that access that secondary authentication that you are who you say you are. Um, teach your staff, share the information with your staff, tell them why they should do things and why they shouldn't do things. If you can afford some basic training packages, bring those in, let them watch the videos. None of us are a fan of the videos, but they get the message across about the basics. Our staff, uh, our employees, our customers are the biggest entry points for um, incursion into our systems. So if we can train people on the very basics of what to do and what not to do, that's going to eliminate a lot of the issues. And there's been books written on this. Um, one comes to mind is Data Driven Security. Um, it's a great book that tells you about the common sense approach to securing your organization. Very easy, very short read. So that's that's one thing you can do. Um, if you want to take it a step up from there, then you just uh, you work on maturing that and then really making some investments beyond that that stage. It's great advice. That's one of our main missions here on the podcast is to educate people about cybersecurity, which is why we bring guests like you on. Also, folks, uh, just as a reminder, one of the things that we sponsor here on the IT Curio podcast is cybersecurity awareness training. It's free for business owners. Uh, we're on a mission to help. Jess, you mentioned those boring videos that you're talking about. And one of the things that we like to do to kind of address that is we actually do live in-person web conferences. The teacher, he's somebody like you. You know, he's been doing it for 30 years. He knows he's a super smart guy. We call him the, he's DJ, the IT wizard, and uh, he actually does magic tricks. We gamify it. And what we find is that when you make it interesting, the employees are actually engaged instead of sitting there on their phone, waiting for the five questions to come up at the end of the section, and then just clicking until they get it right. They retain the information more. You can find links to that on uh, itcurio.com. Oh, and free is always good, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Jess will probably be inviting you to come and uh, participate too. Invite your staff. Uh, you can even help teach the class if you want to. That'd be fun too. It'd be a, a, a kind of like a party. Sounds fun. What about addressing the unknown? There's always things that are new that are popping up. It's all fine and dandy if you know what you're looking for. But how do you address the challenge of how fast things are evolving. and Yeah. Uh, so on an individual basis, it's it's a lot of reading, a lot of reading. 
Um, I just recently finished People Hacker by Jenny Radcliffe, which talks about how people use social engineering to get around security measures. Um, but it's it's reading the technical books, it's reading business books, it's reading finance books, and it's listening to all the podcasts um, that cover those those subjects because each of those areas touches upon risks um, that are pertinent to what they do for the CISO or for the leader of information security and clients. You have to understand business in order to protect the business. So you need to know what those risks are for those different areas. Um, I follow a lot of people um, on on Twitter, I guess it's X now, uh, and LinkedIn, who I consider to be smarter than myself, who specialize in certain areas of security. So I'm listening to what they're saying, uh, what they're seeing, and I'm taking that in. Uh, I'm trying to address early on how we might respond to something of that nature. Um, so it's just constantly, constantly running to keep up. I don't think any of us ever feel like we have all the information that we need to have, but that's kind right. of goes hand in hand with the CISO role is a lot of times you have maybe 60% of the information and you have to make decisions based upon that. Um, over time with some wisdom and experience, you, you get a little better at it, but we can't wait. We don't have the option of waiting um, because Threat actors are constantly, constantly improving their techniques. And every time we come up with a new defense, uh, they're out there coming with a new way around it. So um, it's definitely, if you're going to be in information security, you can't be a person who likes to get anchored to things and only doing things one way and thinking that you can rest on your laurels because that's when you've made your biggest mistake. You have to keep moving. It's just uh, a constant game of learning. Sounds like. Absolutely. Can you share some insights about the internal operations of your company and how your cybersecurity people and your IT people and maybe people who are involved in the company but don't have anything to do with cybersecurity, might not know anything about cybersecurity? How do you manage all that? at Context Labs. Yeah, um, we have a really unique group of people. So I think the people that you have, that you work with, um, are the first part of that of that mix. Um, we're very, a very matrix integration type of organization and we practice extreme openness in what we do. Um, so we have this concept that everyone is a leader in the company. Um, we call it carrying your ball and kicking your ball, but it's it's basically about individual leadership um, and responsibility. So we develop that. Um, we celebrate everyone's unique expertise. So if someone's really good in governance, risk, and compliance, or DevSecOps, or secure development lifecycle of software, um, we encourage that and we identify those people as leaders. Um, we look at all of these individuals as security champions. Um, so what that means is while I may lead the overall program and pull it together and, and, and attach it to a framework, each of these individuals has their own expertise in their own area, and they feed that up to me. Um, my What I give to them is basically how it fits with the overall program and how far along they are in aligning to that program or how I have to make changes for the program to uh, align with their best practices and their expertise, and then with the business. Um, so that's how we've developed it. Um, it's a bit distributive, but we spend a lot of time talking to each other and a lot of time, um, you know, not being adversarial to each other, but practicing the role of the adversary in our conversations so that we don't just think from our one viewpoint, but how does this look if we were outside the organization um, trying to exploit it? Uh, whether that's in the software that we have for our customers or in our just day-to-day -day operations. So, um, yeah, that's how we go about it. Fantastic. That sounds like a good strategy. One of the things that I've noticed in different places that I've worked is it almost feels like the IT department, cybersecurity department are doing to secure data and protect access to data. There's kind of this perception that, oh, man, this is just a, a big hassle a lot of times by employees, right? It's like, they have, I have to change my password every 30 days and there's all these different things that I have to access. How can business owners really help foster a 
attitude of security in, within their company? Sure. Um, so I think it, the key is to establish ownership. I'll, I'll give you an example. A long time ago, I was on the local school board and we had a school that we needed to replace. We had talked with the engineers. It was in bad shape. We knew we needed to replace it. Well, to get the budget, we needed to work with our city council. And we kept approaching the city council saying, we need a new school. This is how much it's going to cost. Here are the reports from the engineers and they weren't having any of it. It finally dawned on me that maybe they didn't understand the problem from the same viewpoint that we understood the pro problem. So I suggested we invite them in to do the whole session with the engineers all over again and let them ask the engineers any questions they wanted to ask them in the process. After one hour, the city councilors had completely taken over the initiative to rebuild the new school and budget it because they had heard on their own directly from the engineers what the problems were with the school. And they now could no longer deny that there was a problem or that they had responsibility to participate with us in fixing the problem. 18 months later, maybe a little longer, we had a new middle school. And this was because they assumed ownership and responsibility alongside of us for the success of replacing that, that school. It's the same thing with an information security and compliance program. You have to tell people why it's important to them. You have to make them interested in it, responsible for it, and feeling like they have a voice in it. So the the worst approach you can take is top down, telling them, just do this. I'm not going to explain it to you. You just have to do it. They can't take that in the context of their daily life in the business and translate it into something that's going to be beneficial for the organization. So when you take the time to explain to them, educate them and give them ownership, they become those security champions I mentioned earlier. It's a lot easier to move the ship in the direction of the wind than against it. I think that partially has to do with whether or not you have a chief information security officer who can present it like that, because you're fortunate enough to have somebody like yourself, they understand why these things are being done and can present it in a way that employees can more easily understand. And one of the funny things is, is that the upper level management, a lot of times are the ones who are responsible for the data breaches. You know, it seems like statistically they fall for the phishing scams and, you know, they're clicking on things that they shouldn't be clicking on a lot more often. Is, um, you know, comparatively, there's fewer of them. So the, the percentage is higher than the rest of the employees and actually falling for stuff like that. Uh, so, I mean, there's challenges. You know, it's not just the, the you know, the, the, the entry level employees that need the training. It's, it's all the way to the very top. And, um, you know, folks like you, having somebody like you as a resource, I think is almost becoming a necessity in larger, even small businesses. Unless you're a really small business, you almost have to have a CISO. I think so. I don't know if it has to be a CISO, but certainly someone with the right skill set and experience to to protect your business. You know, a company that has, uh, that's a global company that has 250,000 employees can probably weather one or two events. A small company of 1,000 or 5,000, that one event could could be the end of the company because financially or rep via their reputation, they just can't afford to stay in business any longer. So um, it's very important for that small business if if they're either privately held or even a small public company to have that resource on board, that person that has that expertise and that's what they're doing all the time. It's just depressing. I always at this point like to kind of change direction and talk about Instead of talking about doom and gloom and all the threats out there, talk about something that is positive and hopeful. Can you share a success story or a particular challenge that you overcame in your work where at, in, at the end of the day, the good guys won? <laughs> yeah, sure. Absolutely. And uh, I'll do this without naming any names or any point in time uh, to protect the organizations that I've worked with. So um I believe heavily in educating my team and sending them out for training, for for webinars, seminars, conferences, because they learn so much. And in some organizations, you can't always pay the value in terms of salary to the person um, that they deserve, but you can give them all these other opportunities. That holds a lot of value for a lot of people. Um, so I sent out my engineers, uh, trained them up on different things, and, and one of them came back and said, 
hey, I have this neat way to tie the firewalls into individual user access, into detected activity on our network. So in theory, if there's an incursion, it should the system should automatically detect it before we're even alerted and deauthenticate the port that the particular user's on, whether they're wired in or wireless. I said, oh, it sounds very interesting. Um, how much is it going to cost? Well, we already have the investment in the organization. So the good news is it's not going to be any additional cost other than a little bit of my time to script this out. Told that person to go ahead. They went and scripted it out. A month later, we had one of our individuals who actually was on the executive team, to your earlier point, who clicked on an email and clicked on a link and it was ransomware. Before we had the alert, that computer was deauthenticated from the network. So by the time we received the alert, we ran up to this individual's office. So he looks at us and says, my computer doesn't work at all. And we said, yes, we know. That's on purpose. You clicked on a link and you got ransomware. She said, how do you know? We said, we set up this elaborate you know, system uh, that detected it. It took you off the network and no harm in that case was posed to anyone other than you. We completely wiped the computer, rebuilt the computer from scratch. Uh, so, you know, all in all, we suffered one computer down for half a day, rebuilt it, put it back on the network. So that was a huge success for us. That was one of those small wins you get where you do the right things ahead of time. You try new things, uh, which at that point was very novel the way we had engineered it and um, protected the organization. And that organization had about 20,000, 30,000 people that were reliant on it outside of the organization. So um, it was a, a critical save for us. A great story. Thank you for that. You need to hear about that. You need to hear about the success stories every now and then. There's so much uh, negative stuff and horror stories. One of the things that I like about you is that you are a great communicator. And I think it's really unique when you can find somebody who is super smart and also uh, such a great communicator. It doesn't always go hand in hand. Folks like yourself, I think, have the ability to inspire others who might be looking to get into this industry. What advice would you give somebody who says, man, this sounds cool. I'm inspired by this person. Uh, how do I get into this? What, what do they do? What if somebody wants to become a CISO? Where do they start? <laughs> well, to, to become a CISO, you're definitely going to want to start uh, at the bottom. Although I know people out there will say, well, uh, you know, I, I became a CISO after being an accountant for 20 years. Okay. You were an executive. You became a CISO. Effectiveness could be judged depending on your results. But traditionally, uh, we see the CISO come up from uh, either IT or information security. But we have a lot of people now coming into the industry from other industries doing um, career switches. And those people that I see that tend to be the most successful have been in service type industries. Now, that could be working in a restaurant, uh, being a bartender, being a chef, um, or it could be being a firefighter or an EMT. Uh, teachers, I've seen teachers be highly successful moving into cybersecurity because they understand the learning process and the teaching process. And when you're supporting other people, those two things, as, as I've just talked about throughout our conversation, are critically important to that communication piece. Um, there are plenty of entry-level programs that are out there. And what we're seeing now is especially for groups that have traditionally been uh, disadvantaged from access to those programs, um, those programs are now there. There's scholarship opportunities available where you don't have to pay for training, where you have a mentor, you have a cohort that you're learning with, and that lasts a year, two years. Um, organizations such as SANS, S-A-N-S, now is offering a degree type program where you don't pay until you graduate and have employment and then you pay a percentage of what you're making over time. And that feeds back into that whole cycle. Yes, veterans, there's so many programs for veterans now coming out of the service. So plenty of opportunity for people who want to get into the industry. Um, if you're, yeah, and if you're mid-career in the industry right now, I've had some people come to me and say, should I go get my master's degree? My first question is, do you have a business degree? 
If they don't have a business degree, then I say that's what you want to go for first because you're moving into that part of your career where you now are going to be talking with the business leaders. And you need to understand, one, how the business works. Two, you need to be able to look at balance sheets. You have to look at uh, operating budgets and capital budgets and understand outlays for that. Um, You need to start thinking like the rest of the business thinks. So before you work on that master's degree in cybersecurity, work on the MBA. If you don't have an MBA, if you don't have a degree, then go for the BA. A lot can be said about needing a college education, but with the business piece, it's really hard to get around that unless you're by some luck of the draw, uh, being exposed to it by someone who's teaching you in the job. Um, so I, I highly recommend that course for, for mid-career and then continue those certifications, the advanced certifications, and then look for those stretch opportunities. So if you're an engineer, look for that first manager position. If you're a manager, look for the director position. And if you're a director, now's the time. If you've mastered everything else that you think you need to learn, go for that stretch role, that CISO role. Uh, chances are you're ready for it. You just don't know it yet. And once you get in there, you'll have a little bit to learn, but you learn quick, just like in, in the rest of your career. Excellent. Yeah, definitely a lot of opportunities out there right now for folks who want to earn a pretty decent living. I mean, some of these jobs, they pay pretty good. You're obviously not going to start as a CISO, but you can get the education to, you know, get into some of these entry level positions pretty easily, right? Doesn't You don't have to have a degree in, in every case to, to work in cybersecurity, right? No, you don't need a, a degree at all. Um, there's there's programs out there that you can go and just start digging around in. Uh, Hack the Box is one that comes to mind uh, that are low cost or no cost. And you can get in there and start learning Linux. You can start learning the basics of cybersecurity. Um, I really, uh, I've seen both people who have come through bachelor's programs in cybersecurity and those who haven't, those who have learned on their own. You know, I I would recommend if I had to go back and do it again, I I would study on my own, try and get in these scholarship programs, get my first job, get some experience and then go for the bachelor's degree and hopefully get the company to pay for some of that. The key on all this, right, is you should keep your costs low to get yourself where you want to go. Um, And those entry level jobs now, they pay pretty well. I think if you looked at uh, the average salary across the job market, not just in cybersecurity, you'll find these entry-level jobs in cybersecurity, they pay above that that level. And you move quickly up depending on how quickly you learn, how many skill sets you, you put in your tool bat, belt, and um, yeah, how you're competing against everyone else. But it's a great career field um, for a long career itself, but also um, if you're intent on getting yourself to a a place of comfort in your life and, and building, um, you know, future wealth for the rest of your, your family or, or, uh, relatives. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Definitely inspirational coming from you with your incredible background. I'm sure you're a fantastic teacher for the employees that work at context labs and that you're well received. So thank you for that very much. Jess, is there any other questions that you wish I had asked you, but I forgot to or didn't get around to? Anything else that you'd like to talk about before we end our show here today? No, I think this has been a great start for people who wanted to learn more about cybersecurity. Um, This will get you going in that direction, whether it's a career or you're just looking for resources. Uh, These are the basics. These are the things you should be looking at. Um, And as always, I'm available. I'm easy to get a hold of via LinkedIn for anyone who has questions, uh, who's looking for a mentor, although I'm currently, I have a full suite of mentees I'm working with. So at least for the foreseeable future (laughs) in that aspect, I've got a full plate and I want to make sure those people get uh, the best of me that I can give to them. But um, certainly I'm available for for one-off conversations uh, for those individuals. Jess. I want to thank you again for being a guest on the IT Curio podcast. So happy you were able to make it on as a guest. Thank you very much. Folks, we'll see you next time on the IT Curio podcast. Don't forget to visit the website, check out some of the resources that we've made available there. Again, it's all about education. We do offer a free cybersecurity awareness training class for folks who want to learn more. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.